welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we sit down and chat with DNR wildlife biologist Brian Roll about the results of the 2022 wolf survey. Basically what it's telling us is the population is stable. They've maximized their carrying capacity. And Cody Cass has a look at the annual Teal Lake Ice Fishing Derby. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. The Michigan DNR published the results of the 2022 wolf survey last month. Normally, they release that data much sooner after they survey, but that took a back burner to the completion of the wolf management plan last year, and they finally made the results public in January. I sat down with Brian Roll, wildlife biologist for the DNR, to talk about their findings, how they came up with those numbers, wolf territories and carrying capacity, new survey methods they are piloting, and more. So we took that data, um, got everything put together, and uh, it came out that we um, estimated um, the minimum population estimate was 631 animals, and that's plus or minus 49 uh, divided into like 136 packs. Basically what it's telling us is the population is stable. When you really look back at the last 10, 12 years, population has been kind of flat, just bouncing somewhere between that six and 700 animals in the Upper Peninsula. So that's excluding Isle Royal. And to our knowledge right now, we, we are not aware of any wolves in the Northern Lower. What that stable population really represents, you know, that they've maximized their carrying capacity. And carrying capacity, you got to think of it, it's really more of a two-part thing. There's biological carrying capacity, but there's also social carrying capacity. How many wolves in the UP are folks willing to tolerate? Basically, all the suitable wolf habitat in the Upper Peninsula is saturated with wolves. It's not like we're, we're finding new packs, you know, every time we go out or anything. It's really just a shifting of the same packs. Their numbers go up or down. Now, we did see a little bit of a density difference um, shift. Typically, the far western UP was kind of the highest density of wolves, and that's really shifted now over to the east UP. So um, something we'll be looking at in the next few years to see, is this a permanent trend? Is this just a one-off kind of thing? But it is kind of interesting that those densities have shifted. I know folks are going to say, oh, there's way more wolves in there. You know, I hear that all the time. If I had a nickel for all that. But you really got to just take a step backwards and look at the biology of this animal. I think we all can generally accept that wolves are very territorial. They really don't like trespassing wolves. They defend their territories. So you have these polygons or their wolf territories. And so there's only so many of those territories you can fit into the Upper Peninsula. So then when you look at the Upper Peninsula and say, well, there's only so much of it is suitable wolf habitat. Obviously the big lakes, towns, some of the ag land is really not suitable wolf territory. So when you actually calculate that out, that comes out to about 63 to 64% of the upper peninsula is actually suitable. Wolves can inhabit it. But that gives you about 10,400 square miles of suitable wolf habitat in the upper peninsula. Now we've already said wolves are very territorial. We have good GPS data from our collars that we've been doing over the years, we know about how big wolf territories are. And so if you take the median of the wolf territories, obviously you're gonna have some really big, some really small, but if you take that median number, it comes down to about 80, 
82 square miles per wolf territory. So you can just do this calculation of 10,400 divided by 82. And then we know the average pack size, which was 4.5 during our two, our 2022 survey, it comes out to about 600 or, you know, 570 wolves. Now it doesn't, that doesn't count the loners. We know there's, you know, 10, 15% loners in the population. Throws that number out right about 600, kind of letting us know we're in the ballpark. Now it is the minimum population estimate that we calculate, you know, 631. We're counting them at their lowest point. You know, they certainly more than double come summer with all those pups born and those kinds of things. But, you know, obviously we need tracking snow, you know, to, to track them. So it's, so we are exploring other methods of calculating abundance of wolves on the landscape. We're actually piloting some of those right now. Both of them are a type of occupancy model, one using trail cameras, one using a winter track count, but not the same way we do it currently. Um, you know, it's more of a presence absence. We're looking for ways to do this more efficiently, but without losing accuracy. The current method is very time consuming, even though we're covering 60% of the UP in any given survey period, it's still a lot of personnel hours out there um, doing that tracking. So we are looking at ways that we can make this more efficiently, but we also don't want to degrade it to the point where we're losing our accuracy in that. Current method is the Upper Peninsula is divided into 21 wolf units. They're um, stratified into high, low, medium, and they're randomly selected each survey period with some assurances that no one unit goes unchecked for, you know, 10 years. We, we got to make sure we get into these units at least at some kind of interval. And so then those units are assigned to trackers. So we're using um, primarily DNR personnel, but we also use some uh, USDA Wildlife Services uh, personnel um, help out a lot as well. And so they're, we're going into those units and we're trying to track those wolves. I tell folks we'd like to get into those packs at least three times. You know, sometimes that's hard, but you know, we don't want everybody to run out there and count the wolves in December and then say that's the number and not check back, you know, in late February and March. Once you've been assigned your area, it is your job to go into that unit and find wolves. Now we have some historic data, so I supply them where have we traditionally found wolves. These packs have been, some of these packs have been here since, you know, 1989. Um, you know, the very first pack that we established back in the Upper Peninsula in North Dickinson County, we call it the Nordic Pack. So you'll get into that pack and then the big part is determining how many are there. That, that's the tricky part. And so that's where it takes some time of following those tracks, getting into that pack multiple times so that you're comfortable with whatever number. If you can get on the tracks, if they get up on a trail or a two track road and they're going for you know a mile plus, usually you'll, you'll see what happens. Like some will come onto the road, some will leave the road, but wolves have a unique characteristic and they will walk inside each other's track. So you can be looking at, you think one wolf going down the road and all of a sudden something catches their eye and they'll split to four and then come right back down to a single track. It's kind of unique. Sometimes there'll be a smaller wolf in there that quite, can't quite make the stride. So you, you'll be able to detect that and those kinds of things. The other thing you have to do, and a big part of it, is look at the surrounding packs around that Nordic pack to make sure that you're actually counting the Nordic pack. So there's the Camp Hope pack just to the north of it. There is the Turner Road pack just to the south of it. So then you have to get in and look, count those packs. And then you try to do it on the same day to say, okay, I got tracks over here. They don't ever cross, say, the Turner Road. Now, if we have a collar in there, a GPS collar, that makes that a whole lot easier. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a collar in every pack. You know, I've had folks tell me, you know, you look at the, you know, I counted six on the trail camera here and Buddy has, you know, eight on this trail camera. Can't you just count them up? No, <laughs> um, because they move that much. And, and you look at their ability to move these long distances. And so folks kind of forget about, you know, this is an animal that goes jogging for 10 to 12 hours a day, every day of their life. That's what they do. 
They're built more like greyhounds if you actually had your hands on a wolf. They're very narrow chested, long legs, um, big endurance runners, you know, so they, that's what they do. So you can see tracks and they put down a lot of tracks because they remember they're out there running around for 10 to 12 hours a day and they're putting down footprints everywhere. Well, you see some wolves here, you drive eight miles over and you see some more wolves, probably the same wolves. Some say, well, why count them? Well, if we're ever gonna get them off the list, that is the number one thing we need to know and be able to prove how many wolves do we have in Michigan? And, and that's another good way to think about it is, you know, people can say, well, there's, you know, whatever number you wanna throw out there, 2,000 wolves. Well, how do you prove that? Our number we can actually prove through science and we can actually in the court of law prove that we have a minimum number. This is the minimum. This is a, we can prove we have this many. So that's really important for delisting. And it's actually one of the delisting requirements that after delisting that we have five years of monitoring. There's also, we wanna get wolves off the endangered species list. They do not warrant being on the endangered species list. They are a recovered species in the areas of the Great Lakes. Now, are they recovered across their historical range? No, um, they're not. But I don't know if they'll ever fully establish their historical range, probably never. I mean, there's cities, there's cornfields, but see, they're using nuances and tweaks of the Endangered Species Act that I think really weaken the act. And, and that's what scares me, is I really do not want to see that Endangered Species Act opened and changed because I think we'll, wildlife will be the loser of that. Um, the, the Endangered Species Act does wonderful things and is, we really should be celebrating that we brought a large carnivore from the brink of extinction to where they were only once in one location in the lower 48 states. Ideally, we would get wolves off the list at some point and we could fully implement our management plan. So in our wolf plan, there are provisions um, to what we would do to um, if the NRC were to ask us, we would let's say they would, they already are game species. Um, so they're delisted on the state level. So those hurdles are already done. Um, so if the NRC were to um, like us to entertain a harvest season, our management plan does tell us what steps we should take before we do that. Um, in basically it's section 12, of the uh, Wolf Management Plan 612. So there's two parts in there. One is a conflict resolution hunt and the other is what we termed a recreational hunt. And recreational is kind of a catch-all term. The fact of the matter is we do recreationally harvest a lot of species. We're not managing, we don't manage gross numbers. You know, we aren't worried about grouse conflicts or anything like that. We just hunt them. <laughs> You know, same thing with a lot of our fur bearing species and those kinds of things. So it spells out two steps we would do with whatever method we would take. Um, but like I said, that would be up to the Natural Resources Commission to uh, the DNR does not make that decision. I hope maybe some of this information clarifies a few things for you, or maybe it doesn't, and do with it what you want. I know wolves are a very polarizing subject here in the UP. There are those who want wolves federally protected forever. There are people who think the numbers need to be managed to avoid human, pet, and livestock conflict. And there are those who really just want to hunt them. There are those who think there are far more wolves than the DNR survey results show, and some that think far less. The sound of a howling wolf brings chills to some spines, while some travel to this region to hear a wolf howl. And we disagree on who has the most say on what and if anything should be done about the wolf population. What we can all agree on is that we will all never agree on the position of this apex predator on this landscape we call the UP. In conjunction with the Heike Lunta Festival in Nagani, the South Shore Fishing Association puts on an annual ice fishing tournament. Heike Lunta also brought the cold down with them kickoff temp was hovering around zero degrees with the wind making it feel much colder. For the 350 plus anglers who were up to the challenge, the only option to avoid the whipping winds was to set up some pip-ups and batten down the hatches. Teal Lake is a hard enough lake to fish as it is. The cold weather certainly doesn't help. 
Besides the offshore weed lines along the southern and eastern edges, there isn't much for organic areas to target. Most anglers targeted the drop-offs near the boat launch and at the southeast part of the lake. A few dedicated anglers took aim at the steep drop-offs along the northern and western parts of the lake. One of those anglers was Adam Peltzer. We knew when we were going to start out uh, hitting Teal Lake that we needed uh, to understand a few options. And um, there's a few of us there. We had three shacks, four shacks actually, um, but three shacks that we were using. One was going to be one that was going to be used to, to roam around and, and start locating fish and start finding different depths. We targeted three different depths. Um, you know, between the three different shacks that we wanted to uh, that we wanted to check and see, we were targeting walleye mainly, um, and found some different depths in shallower water, some deeper water, um, and some different mud flats. And between the three different shacks, we tried to you know figure out exactly what the walleye were doing for that period of time. And um, um, right when the transition happened this morning, when the when when that when that hot period started. All of a sudden dead sticks were going off and and they were coming to the jigs but they weren't hitting the jigs they would hit the dead sticks and then late afternoon all the jigging just started hitting really hard and um, the, the fish just started getting a lot more aggressive they were really finicky towards the early morning um, but towards the afternoon bite it was uh it was game on as far as walleye was concerned when we first came out here we were looking for some kind of structure this this lake is not one for structure it's a big bathtub really um so um, we were trying to locate edges and, and some, some change in depth that we, could, that we could actually find three different depths to, to fish at and truly find out where they were. We, were. we were fishing for a lot of different things. We went with uh, no bait for a while. Um, we, we did use suckers a lot on our tip-ups. We actually were using uh, minnow heads on tip-ups. We were using minnow heads on baits. Uh, we were using, we, it's really trying to figure out exactly what's going to get them going. Uh, when they're really finicky, trying to downsize that bait as much as possible. Uh, when you start understanding that they're starting to get aggressive, start finding a little bit of bigger bait that, that might bring them in and, and, and get them to commit to that bite. It seemed like anglers either had a ton of success or none at all. Could be luck or maybe they knew something the others didn't. Regardless of the fish caught, people are excited to gather around the boat launch to see the results. We had no pike for the kids, so a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, going into the adults, we'll go to walleye first. First place, Mr. Dave Holsworth. Woo! Woo I'd like to give this guy an honorable shout out. He donated all the money for the kids' prizes this weekend too. So big thanks to Dave. Woo! Thank you. With a rough start to the morning and the temps picked up, some decent fish were caught. Along with those rising temps, more people came out of their shacks and started to mingle. With plenty of prizes and raffles, most people had better luck off the ice than on it. This is only one of the many events the South Shore Fishing Association puts on during the year. The largest event of the year is their annual Veterans Fishing Day, which will be held on August 5th this year. This great event to thank our veterans for their service started in 2014 and it takes a ton of volunteers to make it happen. The biggest need is for boats and captains. The amount of veterans able to fish is dependent on the amount of captains that volunteer. Other volunteers are also needed to help coordinate, collect fish, clean fish, and help with lunch. To volunteer, call 906-235-1847 or go online to southshorefishing.com. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. <laughs>